Mike Adams up North Journal. We're up here at Turtle Lake in northern Michigan. I'm with Dr. James Kroll, deer biologist from Texas. We're cutting deer up today. Oh yeah, we're cutting a lot of deer up. Having a lot of fun here. Having fun. We're educating a lot of people and we're learning a lot about this deer herd. Well, we're here in February. Why why are we up here in February doing deer necropsies? Okay. First of all, we refer to these as deer health checks. Okay. And normally you want to you want to check on the health of your deer herds in in the stre most stressful time of the year. Okay. Or the two most stressful times. Normally what we do uh, is especially back in Texas is we run a health check in late August. Okay. And then we run another one in February like we're doing here. Okay. For this herd, one of the advantages of doing it in February is these these deer if they're ever going to be stressed, they're stressed now. And then secondly, it's far enough into the year where we can extract fetuses and measure them so we can get uh, the conception dates for these deer. Okay. Now, we're doing does here in February. In August, do you do bucks? Yeah. Okay. We do bucks and does. Bucks and does. Okay. Bucks and does in August. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sometimes the, the landlord's not very happy about it, but, right. but we will do bucks and does. Okay. What, what do you hope to learn here today from, from what the, the data you're gathering? Well, basically, uh, this is the 15th year we've done this, and uh, we learn something new every year. But but what what we're learning is what is the what is the normal rut pattern of these deer, and then how much does it change over time, and then why does it change? Okay. It drifts it drifts around. I, I saw an article the other day in an outdoor magazine. This guy claimed to be this expert on the rut. And he says the rut never changes. Okay. Oh yes, it does. <laughs> the, the rut peak moves around uh -huh. as much as three weeks. Okay. Depending on where you are, uh, and a lot of that's due to full moons and that sort of thing. So. Okay. What we're but the most important thing we're going to find out here is how tight the conceptions are. If we can have the conceptions to be very tight, say over like a week, then that means that 198 days later, when the fawns are born that they're all going to be born at the same time. Okay. If they're born at the same time, they're born at the best time for their mother to eat. And secondly, we we, uh, we have an edge on the predators. So you're, you're putting them all on the ground at one time, so right. the predator is only getting uh, snacks at one time of the year right. versus exactly right. three months out of the year if you happen to have that long yeah. run exactly right. Gotcha. Okay. Well, the information you're getting here, how do you use that data to maybe make changes for next season or maybe seasons to come? Drop my microphone here. Hang on a second. Microphone came off. Yeah. Okay, how are we gonna how are we doing what now? Say okay, so you get you gathering data today once you analyze that. Right. How are you taking that data and making changes for next year or even seasons further out? Okay, the data that we're collecting is also spatially arranged. What that means is it we know exactly where we took these deer on this property. Okay. So if we run into a pocket of deer that are having a, a health problem or, or they're we're having problems with the conception, then we can target say habitat management, food plots, that sort of thing. Okay. To improve the nutrition in that area. Okay. So you can go in and make changes to either uh, what they're browsing on or the, the trees that's got mass crops or even food plots. Right. Okay. Right. All right. Um, Talking about balanced herd, tightening that rut up, why is a balanced herd buck to doe ratio, why is that important? Okay, a lot of people are, are critical of things like antler restrictions and all that sort of stuff, claiming that that's for, uh, just for trophy management. Well, uh, that's, that's the side benefit, that's, that's the, the, the bait that we use to get people to do it. Okay. The real reason is that God meant for white-tailed deer to have balanced age and sex structure. That, that the balance, when by that I mean a natural deer herd has one to one and a half to one to two buck to doe ratio. Okay. Okay. And then age structure is God also meant for young bucks to have to fight their way all the way up through the through the uh, the peck order. Okay. And a, deer, a mature deer is four and a half years old. The breeding pool is four and a half and five and a half. That, those are the guys that do most of the breed. Not all of it, but most of the breed. When you've got a deer herd where you shot the living daylights out of bucks. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you've got yearlings, even some buck fawns breeding. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Okay. When that happens, what does that do to your deer herd as far as if you have younger bucks breeding? If you have younger bucks breeding, first of all, they're not as physically fit. They haven't been, they haven't been tested out there. And sec secondly, uh, you've got, you've got to usually end up with skewed breeding. Okay. Inexperienced bucks out there. Uh, You've got breeding, your breeding takes over a longer period of time, and then you mess up that, that concise breeding curve. 
Okay. Hang on, we got a, we got one? Where'd she come from? Okay. What are we looking at here? We have a deer that, that is a TB suspect. Okay. And that's one of the things that we're, we're looking for. We've been following. See, our strategy, our management strategy here is to reduce, from day one, has been to reduce TB infection rates. Okay. Uh, and their strategy to do that involves spreading the deer out, improving their nutrition, and not getting them, not having them need to yard up. Okay. Uh, if you do that, you reduce, and we have, we've, we've significantly reduced tuberculosis infection rates. Here. Well, talking about reducing that herd and keeping, keeping those numbers down, your herd numbers down so they have more food to eat, um, keeping disease down. What about the age structure of the does? I mean, from what I've seen here in years past and what y'all have talked about many times is, is taking your, your older does off the fields. Yes, yes. The, there was dogma in the, in the lake states for years, perpetuated by some old-time biologists, that you had to have old does to have reproduction. You did for a stagnant deer herd. Okay. Because a lot of these early biologists, they were studying a stagnated deer herd, which you had very, very old does. What do you mean by stagnated? For stagnated means that, uh, you have real low recruitment, and you've got old, old deer. Some of them, some does as much as 20 years of age. Okay. Okay. What we want to do is we want to have a, a more productive herd is one in which you've got the average age is about three and a half. Okay. Also, when you have average age of three and a half means that uh, that you've got a lot of uh, yearlings and two-year-olds breeding. Okay. If you have that, you have a higher percentage of, of buck fawns in the herd to produce. Okay. That sounds weird, but uh, just trust me on that. we got the data to back it up. Well, I've seen that here. I mean, that, yeah. that's kind of what, what sold me on all of this. Yeah. Uh, the first time I came here and I saw that, it, it, it simply blew my mind because yeah. I'd never heard that before. Yeah. Uh, so. The older the does, once you get up to that three and a half, four and a half, five and a half year old, they start to throw more doe fawns. Is that yeah. true? Yeah. Okay. And, and we're trying to recruit bucks, right. so we want those younger does to be on our fields. Right. Okay. Right. Plus, here, here's a very important part. If you kill a, a doe that's eight years old, what were you doing nine years ago? She's a product of nine years ago. Okay. Also, genetically, she's nine years ago. So when we got young does, we generation time of deer is three and a half years, and we want to turn that deer herd over as fast as we possibly can, and that gives us greater genetic diversity. Genetic okay. diversity is a big influencer of antler size. Okay. Really. Is. Now, we're talking about turning that that herd over three and a half years of age. Does that go for bucks too? No. No. It does not. So how does that correlate? Well, here's how it correlates. I always make this comment that, uh, to groups, and the, the men love it and the women hate it, that in deer management it's a perfect world, old bucks and young does. Yep. But the, as I already said, uh, it was meant for bucks to be in the breeding pool when they're four and a half years old. Okay. Four and a half and five and a half. And so we want those older bucks out there. And they also regulate. It's real funny. When you've got a good age structure, these older bucks were, become what we call regulators is they actually reduce the amount of fighting and antler breakage and mortality okay. by, by regulating who, who gets to fight and everything else. Okay. Um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the, the, the fawns, the fawn recruitment. How does tightening the rut up, when we get all of our does bred about the same time, how does that affect the fawning season the next year? I mean, what does it really do when we put all those fawns on the ground and we spread them out over time? Yeah. You, you, you want them. You do, do not want them to spread them over time. You right. want them to be born in a very tight period. Uh, a big predator around here, fawn predators, bears. Bears are specialized fawn predators. They can smell 400 times better than a bloodhound. Okay, they have a, a specialized uh, search pattern for finding fawns. If we have a lot of fawns born at the same time, then they're not going to find them as well. Same way with coyotes. Okay, what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the lungs for lungworms, which would be right at the, where the, the bronchi come off the trachea and there's none right there, so there are no lungworms in here. And then of course we look at the heart to see if there's any fluid buildup, any infection. This one is perfectly healthy right here. If you found lungworms, what would that tell you? Well, it tells you that there's a bacterial disease at play here. That they would have to culture it to find out what it is and what's going on. Oops, drop that. Oops. Just a second, so we want to solve. 
Oh, okay, go ahead. You're just holding stuff. Yeah. 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 Hang on here. Ovaries. Okay. These are the ovaries. What we'll do is we'll preserve them and then we'll section them and we can count the number of times that she's ovulated. Okay. Here's the uterus. I can tell you right now, looking at this, there's two horns of the uterus. We've already removed the ovaries. There's only one, there's only one fetus in here. Okay. Because it would both both sides would be like this. So we'll cut it open. It'll be a lot of amniotic fluid. There's somewhere in here, there it is. There's a fetus. An immature fawn. This one happens to be a female. Okay. Now we're gonna give give it over put it over here. And using this scale, go ahead. Uh, we can tell at, at how long ago, or at what, how many days ago this the fawn was conceived. These are kidneys out of this dough. Let me tell you something. In the vast majority of Michigan, this time of the year, you're not going to find does with this kind of kidney fat. This may, this tells me that had we not shot the deer for testing. Uh, she would have. I mean, she would have done perfectly well all through the rest of the winter. So you know, we nice run a lot of times just a, if it's just a, just nothing but a kidney. Okay. So we'll be calculating kidney fat index off of that. So you use that in bone marrow to, to determine how stressed the deer is this time of year. Yes, sir. Okay. And right here is the liver. And this younger does. How old is this doe? Three and a half. Three and a half. Younger does like two and a half and three and a half have a greater challenge of liver flukes. Okay. As the does get get older, they'll have they'll have less they'll have to build up some immunity. But liver flukes really don't hurt whitetails. They're, they're really hard on animal, on deer species like moose. Okay, but on whitetails, they really I've never found any evidence. Now see what happened. We had scars here. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we're not finding any flukes, which tells me that this girl has managed to throw these flukes off, and she's pretty well weathered the storm. I need my bag holder here. Oh yeah. Hey everybody, you gotta look at this. This is not surprising. Did y'all see the fat on the kidneys? Show me how much fat's on that kidney. Look at that. Alright, and look here. This is the mesentery. It goes around the intestines. Okay? Look at mesenteric fat. This is February. It's almost Valentine's Day. Yeah. This dough would have had no problem at all making it till spring. Okay, we get deer through here a lot of times that that don't have that. Now here's some fat on the on the this actually on the rectum, but you notice that it's got a getting a funny look to it. That's because she's starting to, was starting to metabolize it and it's just leaving behind connective tissue, so it looks kind of funny. People worry about it being some kind of disease. Did we get everything out of here? Yes. Okay. Now these, I've said uh, before, we can take these pellets out of here. We used to do this. We can take these pellets, deer poop, and we can send them to the laboratory and they can tell us how good a diet she was on. Right? They can correlate uh, some wavelengths of near infrared to digestible protein, uh, digestible energy, and phosphorus. So. And they can, we can do this on a weekly basis. So if we can make some changes in what's going on out there, we're straight. All right. Looking back at the age of the, the does that are, are dropping fawns, yep. I gotta imagine when we get older does in our herd that, that we wanna get off the field, come fawning season, they're gonna take the best food, they're gonna take the best cover. Oh yeah. And, and so you're pushing your younger does out of those areas to, right. with, with the young bucks. Exactly right. Okay. That they, the, the old does, there's a pick order in a doe group. See, a doe group, every deer in it's related. They will not tolerate another doe from outside that group. Okay. We have put, uh, brought does in, in pens, we brought does in, put them in there with, with a doe group. They were never accepted over a, over a six, seven year period. Okay. They were never included in the group. It's just the way they are. So, didn't let them play the reindeer games. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, looking at tightening that rut up, we, we talked yeah. about trying to tighten the rut up. If we don't get that rut tightened up, we have does are being bred on the second, third go round. How yeah. does that impact the health of the bucks? Oh, it has a, it has a huge impact on the bucks. The, uh, 
if you've got what we call a trickle rut, mm -hmm. and these does are coming in estrus over a long period of time, these bucks are constantly running, constantly lose. A buck will lose 30, 40 percent of his body weight as it is. But you wear that deer down and stress him, and a lot of these in in Michigan, for example, a lot of these bucks and these kind of these kind of herds are really susceptible to pneumonia. It's probably one of the biggest killers of, of bucks late in the year's pneumonia. So if they're, they're chasing breeding, they're not getting that chance to recoup and, and build the stores back up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We've done some studies on that where we synchronized estrus and does mm -hmm. in, in control conditions, and uh, we put we uh, normally a buck will only breed three or four does. Okay. That's all. But we put them in a pen with twelve does and synchronized all the does. And the bucks bred every one of those 12 does and didn't lose much weight. Okay. Because they were all in at the same time. Right. Okay, we're talking a lot about the uh, the age of our herds, you know, the, the, the in, in our deer densities as well. How does that play in, in keeping the herd numbers down and keeping our age structure right? How does that play into controlling diseases and keeping diseases? What density? Yeah, and keeping it away, away from your herd. Well, there's two kinds of diseases. There are density, Dependent and density independent diseases. Uh, pneumonia, tuberculosis, a density dependent disease. Okay. Density is the number of, of individuals packed in a unit area. The lungs are clear on this. Uh, but there are density independent diseases, things like anthrax, and uh, really, quite frankly, CWD is, is a density, a frequency dependent disease. It's not a density dependent disease. Okay. So you can kill, you can kill uh, deer all day long, and you're not going to reduce CWD unless you kill the right deer. All right, I'm going to go through this liver here. That liver looks pretty good on the surface. We, we cut half inch slices through it, and I always say if she's free of flukes, she's ready to fry. <laughs> That's what I was getting to say. It looks like it's ready to go on the, yeah. in the pan. Uh, some people don't <laughs> like that whole idea, but it won't stop waning. Uh. Kidneys, now, ah, ah, look here. This deer has, is starting to get a lot less kidney fat, use up her kidney fat. Still good, decent kidney fat, but that doesn't look a bit, bit like that one I showed you all. No, it there. doesn't. No. You know, here, here in Michigan, unlike other states, we've, we've got a lot of public land that people hunt. We've got a lot of hunters out there that may be questioning how can we take what you're teaching here and apply that? It's like, how can I make a difference? What's the one thing you, you would tell somebody like that? Well, one, one way you can make a difference, and it's already starting. It's happening all across the nation. You remember when, uh, when you used to keep every fish you caught? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, they came up with catch and release. You right. know? And now you're a low life if you keep a fish. <laughs> right. So it's not as, it's kind of backfired on us on some things. However, as I travel around the country and talk to hunters, we talk about antler restrictions. And right. a lot of them say, well, we don't need them. I go, why not? So nobody I know will even shoot a yearling buck. Mm -hmm. uh, it's changing. People have killed a zillion bucks now. They're tired of killing yearlings. They want to kill mm -hmm. better deer. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so on public land, uh, you know, you can do your part. You can't just be selfish and, you know, the guy, I got to get my buck. Right. If it had an antler that big, I got to get my buck. Right, right. So, so you can do your part. But there are some places like in Pennsylvania where there, there are groups of hunters that have adopted public lands mm -hmm. and they go out there and they plant trees and they plant food plots and they, they help the deer out. So the, the, I have absolutely nothing against public hunting. I think it's a great thing for folks. But people who are, who, Take advantage of public hunting. What are they? What are they giving back? What are they paying for it? You know, it doesn't happen for free. It's public land, and it has right. to be managed. All that sort of stuff. So do your part. Be, become part of the stewardship of the land. Sure. Right. Sure. The world's changing. 
switching gears just a little bit. Earlier today, we we're talking about you you're talking about uh, the Braskas. I want to just kind of shift <laughs> gears completely. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've heard a little bit about this, but uh, for the people who watch and talk uh, a little bit about what you were telling us with, with the stomach and, and what a Braska can do if it's yeah get, gets too much of it. Yeah, and, you're, and what you're going to do right now, you're asking me a question that's going to make some of your viewers uh, just hate me. That's but okay. You know we what? do that sometimes. Well, at my point in my career, I don't really care. <laughs> but I'm mean, going to tell you what I know. Our, our research clearly shows, and other research, especially in Europe, that uh, the brassicas have toxic alkaloids in them. Now, there's an interesting thing going on in the deer industry. You know, all these you've got all these products out there that people are buying. Hunters are suckers for anything. But there's no regulation to them. And the other thing is that it's difficult to show that, that what somebody's doing is hurting a herd because you're, they're a free-ranging animal. <laughs> if you do something that kills them, they go off somewhere and die and you don't know it. Right. Okay. Secondly, uh, you can feed a deer something that's really not that good for them, but they'll balance off with, with brows out there. Mm -hmm. As long as they got brows, well, that's a small fetus, isn't it? They'll, they'll balance it off with brass. But when we get in a bad winter, and you've got this brassica plot there under the snow, and deer, eat, uh, deer get on it and that's all they eat, mm -hmm. and you're risking hemolytic anemia and diarrhea and all kinds of wonderful things that you don't want in your deer herd. But uh, it's amazing to me that people plant, treat what you plant as a religious experience. You know, when I, when I pointed all this out, there are people out there that, that didn't really think my parents were married. <laughs> it's amazing what, what bloggers say. Right. Based on no information, there's a liver fluke. Quite frankly, I am not interested on what avid bow hunter 356 thinks about anything. Right. <laughs> so first of all, he doesn't use his name. And secondly, he really doesn't know what he's talking about. So there are people out there that are going to you know, listen to what I just said and they're going to they're going to go, they'll yell foul, and they'll go, well, that's nonsense. I do it. I don't hurt my deer. How do you know? My question is prove it to me. Right. Prove it to me. We've run into a lot of people over in Wisconsin that have had big brassica plots that have lost a lot of deer in bad winters. Because that's the only thing they've got to go kidney. to. there's a kidney. That other one wasn't, was it? <laughs> How old was she? I don't know. She was... Oh, uh, yeah. No. Six and a half? Good for her. So six and a half, that's what you're trying to get off the plots. Yeah, absolutely. But she was doing all right. I just tell people, by the way, a six and a half year old buck is a 72 year old man. Four and a halves and five and a halves do the majority of breeding. Okay. As a 71 year old man, I can tell you that things are different when I was 30. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's breaking the inside from another club, aren't they? Oh, cool. Anything else that you'd just kind of like to say or share to some of the people out there? Just well, you can ask me the you can ask me the loaded question: Is uh, what's the CWD going to do? You want to go there? I'll go there. <laughs> Let's go there. All right. Ask away. <laughs> Well, we've got it here in Michigan. Yes, you do. You, you know, um, what are we looking at here? How, it, is it controllable? The, you know? the, the short answer is no. Okay. Uh, it, before long, it'll be found everywhere. Okay. I do not think, I strongly do not think that CWD is spreading. What I, what I really think is that testing has spread. Where, how, do you, how do you, do you get rid of it? What's the prognosis? What are we looking at here in Michigan? What you're looking at in Michigan is that what you're going to do is in certain areas you're going to continue to have it. There's a there's no right now there's no workable strategy for quote eradicating it. Right. There's no workable strategy for eradicating tuberculosis. Right. But we man we can manage, which I think, but every attempt to eradicate has failed miserably. Not a single case. Okay. That it worked, and it sure doesn't involve going out and slaughtering thousands of deer. Right. That doesn't work. The kit, the liver's good. Uh, 
I think that the deer itself is going to solve the problem because there is a genetic link to susceptibility. And I think if we believe in natural selection, and in some places we're starting to see a change in the genetic composition. Okay. So I think the deer will take care of themselves. Let me tell you something about whitetail deer. I got all the faith in the world in them. They have survived probably six million years. And uh, they've encountered all sorts of things that have gone. They were around, they were around with saber-toothed tigers. But I think we, they can do all right. So <laughs> right I'm not really right. that worried about it. What I am worried about is there are interest groups out there that, are, that stir up a lot of bad things mm -hmm. based on bad information. And the worst one of all is if I wanted to kill deer hunting, if I wanted to kill hunting, of which deer hunting is the major part, mm -hmm. I would convince I would convince hunters and the public that venison is an unhealthy item to eat. Right. I've heard that. Once said you before. do that, hunting's dead. Right. And they're still although they may they may sooner or later they're gonna they're gonna get some animal to come down with CWD, I guarantee you. Right. If, here, here's the thing you gotta you gotta understand. This all started with mad cow disease. Mm -hmm. All right, in Europe, it, we, we had a variation of it called variant Crossfugacus mm -hmm. disease. People got it. Right. Okay, now, that was back in the 80s. Since then, there have, how many million pounds of beef have been eaten in Europe? In all of Europe, 278 people mm -hmm. have died from cross, variant Crossfugacus disease. In that same period of time, how many people slipped and fell in a bathtub? Right. Yep. I guarantee you. It's every life is precious, but it's all about cost benefit. Right. We got a two two and a half year old buck coming in off property. All right. So you'll have us get one. Oh good. This is off property. But I'm not this is just the Back to the CWD, I'm not I'm not saying it because she's standing right there, mm -hmm. but there's a there's a breath of fresh air in the in what we've got going here. I think she's gonna she's she's looking at new ways. She's oh. thinking outside the box. I was so. about to tell you that he skews lies, and then I heard him. And I was like, I should feel like now's enough time. Oh no, he's a truthful man. <laughs> So taking care of some of these things, as long as it's clear, and, and, and managing, we got to think outside the box, educate ourselves, yep, and, and keep pushing forward. Basically, is the way to, to take care of some of this stuff. Absolutely, and my whole career has been aimed at at getting people to make the transition from hunter consumer to hunter manager. Mm -hmm. uh, society won't accept us if all we do is want to go kill things. If we're out there helping, doing good things for deer and other wildlife, and part of that good is in controlling herds and maintaining health and nutrition, that's a win-win. Holy moly. Female. Well, six years ago, you all made a believer out of me. Being here and seeing this is, is what educated me and in turn what I do around. Let me, so. I appreciate you saying it, but let me point something out. That is the key to deer management. Mm -hmm. We have gone through a time where, when biologists have quit dealing with the public, quit being out there helping people instead of lecturing them. Lecturing them especially about things they don't know. Mm -hmm. So work, this kind of thing here, working with all these clubs, they come here, they see this. Some of them are bringing their own deer in. Right. You know, this is the way you get people involved in management. You don't get them involved in management by holding a public hearing, okay, or making them come to Lansing. Come out and let them see it and be a part of it. See it, be a part of it. Well, I'm gonna let you get back in the All middle right, of this. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome.